So question, if you had a project, a machining project, and you had to make the decision on what type of cutting tool you had to purchase, what type of geometry, what type of material, and what type of coatings you had to have, would you know what to do? Well, in this video today, we're going to go over exactly what is cutting tool geometry, as well as why is cutting tool geometry important. And I'm going to go over a few other things as far as coolants and coatings and other issues, but primarily, you know, what cutting tool geometry. So stay tuned and we'll go through that video today. Well, this is Professor Cummings, and in this discussion, I wanted to talk about cutting tool geometries, as well as other parameters, other decisions that you can make as an engineer when it comes to selecting the proper cutting tools. Now, we can't talk about cutting tool geometry without also discussing material properties. So material properties that you're going to be concerned with are things such as how ductile a material is, how abrasive it is, the hardness of the material, as well as the thermal conductivity of the material. Certain materials like titanium, you know, it has a low thermal conductivity and that can actually cause you issues with your tool wearing out prematurely because the heat actually travels back to the tool. But issues like ductility can lead to other issues such as bird's nesting, which is what you're seeing in that, that visual there. And when, to understand bird's nesting and why this is an issue, you got to understand, you know, what a cutting or what a chip is. You know, a chip is you remove a material from a, your workpiece. And when you remove that chip, you're also removing a lot of the heat. And you're producing this very sharp, very thin piece of material that can freely, you know, either fall into the flume as a small segment, or it can potentially wrap around and further damage your workpiece or be a hazard to the, to the operator. But, you know, that's something that as we look at different types of tool geometry can actually eliminate or greatly reduce that one. Now, when it comes to ductility as well as abrasiveness and other chemical you know, reactivity of the material, you can end up with something like on the left here, which is called built up edge, which is a simply as the material is cut, it actually starts to adhere to the workpiece itself. And then, you know, with hardness and abrasiveness, you can end up increasing something called uh, the uh, flank wear, which you see here on the right, which is just the amount of tool that's getting worn away as it goes through its typical cutting process. You also see a lot of cracking and, and microchipping that's taking place here. And again, you know, decisions you make early in the process, as you understand cutting tools, can help mitigate this. So let's start talking more about the geometries that are part of any type of cutting tool. So anytime you're cutting material, you're actually going into the material, uh, plunging in, to creating a new work surface, removing the old work surface, you're actually generating a chip. You actually have a certain depth of cut that your, your tool is going in, a certain depth of cut from this height. So you're plunging a certain amount, you're creating a new work surface, and you've got a chip riding up the face of this tool. Now, all these things come into play as far as what type of cutting tool geometry you're going to have. So the first thing we can talk about here is that rake face. Like I said, this rake face is just the interface between the, the tool and the chip, and it allows the chip to actually exit from the whole cutting process. The next, you have something called a rake face angle. And again, this ties with, at least partially ties with how ductile the material is, because as you start from this plane that's normal to the workpiece and your your rake face goes over from this point and creating that that rake angle that allows you to make or depending on what rake angle you select that can actually be beneficial or detrimental to the kind of material that you're actually cutting so this this is actually a very important feature to keep in mind another feature is the flank which is just the back side of this of your tool so that is the flank now the flank and then with this new work surface down below it creates what's known as the relief angle so this angle is what allows you not to rub the workpiece so this helps you know make sure that you've got a good uh, surface finish as well as helps you prevent damaging or prematurely wearing out your tool 
by causing you know increased cutting forces and, and increased heat. Now you also have a nose radius, which is just down here at the very end, uh, right in here. That's your nose radius, and that nose of your tool actually you know, the more of the bigger your radius is the stronger your tool is but also your cutting forces start to go up you can make the nose radius very small end up with a very sharp tool but you'll end up actually having a weaker tool it's more prone to fracture so another decision has to be made and you know the uh, parameters of the material the properties of the material will actually play into that now as the chip starts to actually go from the workpiece material in your depth of cut to actually forming a chip itself, you are going to develop something known as a shear plane. This is just a plane, you know, that actually goes from where it's starting to break away. You're starting to break away and you've got a large shearing force that's taking place in here, or a shearing force that's taking place in here. And this is actually the separation from the workpiece. So the beginning of a chip, you're officially starting to cause a chip here. And this shearing angle you know, again, that's a function of how ductile the material is, how hard the material, and how tough the material is, is another important factor in your, your tooling decision. And we're going to see how all these things tie together. So as you're cutting through this material, you're going to start generating forces. I mean, you're going into a piece of material, a workpiece, steel, aluminum, or whatever it is, and you're actually removing the material. So you're going to start generating forces as you travel, in this case, you're looking at it going from left to right, going from left to right, which is the cutting direction. And one of the most obvious forces is going to be the cutting force. And that's just driven by the tool going through the metal itself. Another force you're going to be generating is actually called the frictional force. You can see it is just running down the rake face, and it's just the chip riding up against that surface. The resistance to the chip flow is friction, and hence the frictional force. The next is the shearing force. You can see this is just the chip actually being generated. So it's going from the workpiece to actually forming a chip, and that's causing a force along that shearing plane known as the shearing force. And then there's a normal force. As the chip presses against the rake face, you know, as an applied force, the reaction back to it is the normal force. So just the force on the rake face just being generated by the chip. Now when we look at all these different forces and all these different angles, you can see that there's a relationship between all of them. And a very intelligent engineer, once named Eugene Merchant, came up with something called the Merchant Equation. Now I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but you can see that this shearing angle, the shear angle, is a function of your rake angle, and this beta here is your friction angle. And what this UG Merchant Equation tells us is that the size of the rake angle, which you have control over, which you can actually dictate, dictates the shear angle and the thickness of the chip itself. So this is what we learned from the rake angle. And why is that important? Because that lets us know how much shearing stress is going to be taking place, how much heat's going to be getting generated. And that helps us understand a bit about the tool wear. So all these things tie together, and depending on what rake angle we select, they can actually greatly affect and impact the type of cutting tool we get, or cutting uh, behavior we have, as well as the quality of the workpiece and how much power is consumed. Now, with all this tool going through, you know, all this forces and all this heat being generated, we're going to have some type of tool wear. So there's going to be certain types of tool wear we can look at and one is cratering which will happen right in the rake face you can see it is just a hole being worn into the rake face from the chip running against it again you know depending on how much friction is it tells you how much that uh, cratering is going to take place then there's flank wear and this is how we usually determine how long that tool life is it's typically a measurement from the edge of the the tool or the nose down to how much into the flank face or the flank of the tool actually gets worn away. And this, you know, if you look at it on the actual diagram or the, the GIF here, it's this area here. This is the, the flank face that's actually being worn away. So that's the flank wear. And then the last one is built up edge. And that's a function of the reaction between the, the material 
that you're actually cutting as well as the substrate in the cutting tool where material actually starts to build up since the name built up edge it actually starts to build up on the tip of the tool now the problem with this is that as it actually starts to adhere it actually generates more force and as the chip runs against it it has the potential for actually breaking away and taking some tool with it you know hence rupturing the tool so those are three types of wear that can actually take place you know depending on your the properties of the material and your selection of your cutting tool geometries that, that you do have some control over and can dictate now what are some of the ways you can control this well one is actually something called chip breakers a chip breaker has one job and one job only and it just simply disrupts the flow of the chip so it disrupts the amount of that that chip actually running up that rake face so if it's going up it actually forces it to bend over more and prematurely break itself off remember when we saw the birds nesting on the earlier slide that's one of the applications of chip breaking that can actually help you get rid of and what it looks like is you take something along the rake face it can either be built into the rake face itself to create a disruption here we have actually a cratering effect that's built into the tool so the ship would actually ride in hit this surface get disrupted prematurely bend and actually break or you can actually build it into the tool or you know externally clamp it onto the tool and this metal here is actually the chip breaker so the chip actually rides up the rake face hits this chip breaker curls up prematurely bends and breaks again this over on the left is without a chip breaker and here on the right these small segmented chips is the benefit of having something that can break up your chips and again this is how you would combat something that is a particularly ductile metal or a metal that you know isn't going to otherwise break and cause that sort of bird's nest and you wouldn't need something like a chip breaker when cutting something like cast iron now other ways of dealing with uh, issues with cutting you know without actually dealing with tool geometry I just put these two on here is coolants and coatings now these are two things they actually do to reduce friction help address with heat as well as issues like built up edge that could potentially you know it just caused by chemical reaction or some sort of affinity between your tool and your workpiece material so what do coolants do well they obviously they they reduce heat but they also reduce the friction there's usually some sort of lub lubricating action lubricity with uh, coolants uh, and they actually flush ships and there's also rust inhibition and this is one of the reasons you don't use straight water water is a, a very poor lubricant and it also can you know encourage rusting most coolants actually have a rust inhibitor and have some lubricity so it removes the heat actually helps reduce friction and helps flush away the chips now what the coatings do again they reduce the friction and they inhibit any type of adhesion to the cutting tool material so this works as a barrier between the cutting tool and the and the workpiece helps reduce things like built up edge so if that video was helpful to you at all go ahead and subscribe to my channel I do videos on manufacturing as well as different engineering topics please share the video to anyone you think might be able to benefit from it so you can subscribe to me on YouTube you can also follow me on Twitter where I go through a lot of different uh, engineering and manufacturing topics up to date talking about the skills gap and in industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution you can also follow me on Google Plus. I have two fairly active communities. One is uh, Manufacturing Skills and Education, where I talk about obviously manufacturing and manufacturing skills, manufacturing technology, and I try to help people showcase their companies on that channel. And then there's the Engineers Reference, where I talk about general engineering activity, uh, a lot on automation, a lot on just like new technologies and different types of you know math applications and different things that engineering goes through so another pretty active community and you know anytime you see my little logo the infinity double infinity you can know that I've gotten my presence there uh, again thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video